I came of age in the 1980s, at the height of the feminist movement, when girls like me were being told they could do anything. I was also the youngest of three daughters, and often joked that by the time my parents got to me, they just gave up and raised me as a boy. Perhaps for that reason, or maybe because it's just my natural personality, I was competitive and ambitious, more so than most girls at the time. So I suppose it shouldn't be too surprising that when I graduated from college in 1992, I went to work on Wall Street, the hardest driving game in town. I began my career in the mergers and acquisitions department at Morgan Stanley. And in most ways, I was a perfect fit. I was surrounded by smart, hardworking, driven people. And although the hours were insanely long, the opportunities for learning were even greater. At age 22, I found myself constructing complex financial models, interacting directly with CEOs, and even flying on the Concorde to London to market a billion dollar stock offering. After two and a half years at Morgan Stanley, I was recruited to join a mid-sized private equity fund with seven other investment professionals, all of whom were men and all of whom were older than me. It was another great career decision. For the most part, the guys were welcoming and interested in teaching me and helping me contribute fully to the firm. Several of them became my friends, my mentors, and some of my greatest supporters, both while I was at the firm and since then. And I also loved the work, doing deals, mentoring our younger professionals, and was made a partner at age 31. In addition, I was given the opportunity to join the board of a publicly traded company in 1998 which opened the door for me to that rarefied world. Since then, I've served on the board of six public companies and continue to serve on one today. There were also challenges, however, because in one important way, I didn't fit. I was female. My income in class at Morgan Stanley was 25% women, but there were only a tiny number of more senior women at the firm. As a result, the culture was a bit like a locker room with a casual, taken for granted sexism going on, lots of foul language, aggressive behavior, and the occasional dirty joke. My private equity fund was a bit better, but fundamentally, not that different. At both firms, in order to fit in and succeed as a female, you had to have a thick skin and carefully pick your battles. I also learned that it was important to get, really get below the surface behavior and get to know your colleagues, because the person making the off-color remark was often a much greater supporter of women than the one who always said the politically correct thing when you were in the room, but made sexist comments when you left. In addition to adapting to the male culture, I also had to get used to almost always being the only woman in the room. Often men would make surprise comments upon meeting me such as, you're a woman. I mean, I actually had to wonder, like, do they think I don't know? You know. <laughs> I'd also occasionally get requests from, you know, investment bankers who just assumed I was a secretary walking down the hall and to get coffee or make copies for them and whatnot. Despite this, though, looking back, I can honestly say that my experience on Wall Street was really fantastic, and I would definitely do it all over again. However, in 2003, I was ready for some new challenges. So after much soul searching, I decided to leave the industry. I didn't leave to have babies or get married or anything like that, though in retrospect, I do think gender played a role in the decision. There were simply no female role models that I could look up to to see what the next chapter of my life might look like if I stayed in the industry. And to be honest, I think I had proven what had drawn me to Wall Street in the first place, that I could play with the boys and win. After considering a number of opportunities and reading several books on gender bias and the lack of women in leadership, I decided to pursue a PhD at Cornell, studying bias against women in the business world and how to reduce it. It is a topic that I am deeply passionate about, both personally and professionally. Along with my board work, teaching, research, and speaking on these issues has been my life's work for the last 14 years. And during that time, I have spoken to literally thousands of people on the topic. And every time I give a talk, I leave feeling inspired. However, when I look back at the numbers and consider the progress that has been made since I entered the workforce in 1992, I have to admit I'm feeling pretty discouraged. Back then, there were only two women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. 
Today, two and a half decades later, there are still only 23. And if going from two to 23 sounds like a lot of progress to you, consider this. Those 23 women represent only 4.6% of all Fortune 500 CEOs. And even more striking, among those 500 CEOs, there are more men with the first name James than there are women. <laughs> it's like kind of hard to believe, right? I mean, it's crazy. I also see this on a personal level. My son Carter, some time ago, had the opportunity to meet several of my board colleagues, and afterwards excitedly reported to me that one of them had given him $20 for his birthday, which happened to be that week. When I asked him to describe the director so that I could thank them, Carter said, huh, he was like an old white guy. <laughs> that was not helpful at all. Why? Because, as usual, all of the other directors on the board were old white guys. So yeah, there has not been enough progress. I'm also frankly tired of giving advice to women on how to fix themselves to adjust to the male norms of our workplace and our society. Instead, I think it's time that we move from awareness building and fixing women to taking action to change our society and the organizations in it. And when I talk about taking action, I'm not just talking about taking action on the part of women. Guys, I'm also talking to you. Gender bias is not just a women's issue. It's a human issue. Sure, gender stereotypes disproportionately harm women in the work workplace, but they also harm men in many ways. Stereotypes that men must be the primary breadwinner limit their opportunities to be fully involved dads. When a stay-at-home dad tried to join our local mom's club so that his small child could have play dates with other kids, the organizational charter actually required a special vote to admit him. I'm glad to say he won the vote, but it was not unanimous. Other stereotypes, such as one requiring men to be strong and tough, result in men stifling their emotions. They also result in men being more likely to engage in and be victims of violent crime, more li likely to die from suicide, substance abuse, or unintentional accidents, and less likely to seek help for health issues of any kind. And as a result, men have a shorter life expectancy than women. So yes, gender stereotypes are an issue we should all care about, male or female. We need to get everyone caring about these issues and taking action to reduce bias. But I hear all the time from people, and especially men, that they don't know how to help. They're terrified that even if they do try to help, they'll get it wrong, say the wrong thing, offend someone, or get kicked out of the boys club for being seen as a feminist. So what can we do? First, we must acknowledge and admit the fear that people have about speaking up on gender bias. Recent research shows that men are three and a half times more likely to give feedback to a junior man than a junior woman. This is terrible for women. Without feedback, mentorship, and sponsorship from senior men, women won't develop the skills or the political capital that they need to advance. Further, for all the positive that has come from the Me Too movement, we're now seeing more and more backlash from it, with comments such as, we just shouldn't hire women, or I just won't associate with women at work at all. Women are scared too, though. They are afraid to call out bias too aggressively and get labeled as sensitive or a bitch. However, they're also afraid that if they do nothing, they'll never be given full opportunity. Or worse yet, they may be driven from a job by sexual harassment. All of these fears are legitimate. So how do you overcome fear? You start with acknowledging it and then finding ways to create trust. We must shift the mindset around diversity away from political correctness, fear, and punishment and toward one focused on curiosity and learning. We need to favor communication over avoiding offense. In creating a politically correct environment, we haven't gotten rid of the biases We've just driven them underground. Now to be clear, it's not that I want to see us go back to a place of incivility and open insults and, and bias. But we also can't let political correctness stifle honest and open conversation that can help both individuals and organizations reduce bias. We need to find a way to strike the balance and not sweat the small stuff in order to get to a place where people fundamentally have fewer gender biases and therefore 
are not inclined to say offensive things. I say this because my strongest support and sponsorship throughout my career has come from two men who are really, really not very politically correct. They were the people who promoted me to partner at age 31, and they have recommended me for four of the six boards that I've been on. Today, they continue to provide advice to me while still not being very PC. I trust them, and they trust me on a human level. So we can talk openly about issues like the Me Too movement without rancor or taking offense and come away with a deeper understanding of all sides of the issue. If in the early days of my career, I had reacted to every off-color remark or inappropriate comment with anger and judgment, I never would have developed the deep level of trust and relationship that I have with so many former colleagues from Wall Street. So my first suggestion is that we must focus on creating an environment where people are allowed to say the wrong thing as long as it's said in an effort to understand the experience and perspective of someone different from them. My second suggestion is that for those of you that don't know much about gender bias, and in particular unconscious bias, which is what's driving most of this, educate yourselves either by talking to colleagues that do or attending a, a session at your company or your school or simply reading up on it. This will help you identify bias when it is happening, either in your own behaviors or in the behavior of others. Third, if you aren't sure how to behave, ask. Ask what's okay and what's not okay. If you ask questions from a place of curiosity and admit that you're perhaps nervous in asking because you don't want to offend, Nobody's going to be offended. Yes, we know it takes some courage. But honestly, if a man in good faith asks a woman about whether or not a specific comment or behavior crosses the line of sexual harassment or sexism, 99% of the time, he will not only get a thoughtful answer, but he'll earn some trust and credibility from that woman. And ladies, you must be open to engaging in these conversations in a non-judgmental way and be aware of your own biases. Remember, men and women hold gender stereotypes and engage in bias against both genders. Hopefully, through engaging in conversation, men and women can get to know each other on a deeper level. And instead of seeing the difference in their gender, they'll see their similarities as humans. Fourth, be an active ally to women in the workplace, whether they're in the room or not. Let me just give you three examples of how you can do this on a day-to-day -day basis. First, if you are part of a group where a woman's contributions are being ignored or co-opted, simply redirect the conversation back to her in a non-confrontational way. John, I'm so glad you mentioned the idea that Susan said earlier. Susan, what were you thinking? John, what did you like about it? No one is directly called out or shamed in doing this, but it clearly makes the point that the idea was Susan's. Second, if someone is being sexist, help to stop it. I've had dozens of experiences in meetings where colleagues made inappropriate comments or jokes. One of my least liked ones, the least funny ever was, we better have John sign this very important letter instead of Susan, because if a girl signs it, no one will take it seriously. In that instance, as in most of these situations, everyone looked at me as if it was my job, the victim, to address the situation. Don't let that happen. Instead, be an ally and call it out. If you can use humor, even better. For example, during a discussion about improving our company maternity policy, when a colleague joked that these women should really just stop having so many babies, I sarcastically responded, oh no, no, better yet, we should just hop, stop hiring women entirely. Everyone got the point that it was offensive and got back to the discussion. Third, when you're with a group of men and one of them makes sexist or sexual comments about one of your female colleagues, just say you aren't comfortable with the statement. Yes, it takes courage, but I suspect that many of the men in that room feel the same way. And of course, if you see sexual harassment in action, use the same technique to intervene. And to the women in the room, let's be honest, we make sexist and objectifying comments about men at work too. We also need to stop doing that. These are just a few ideas of how we can move from awareness of inequality and bias to taking action to reduce it, to not just addressing the surface stuff of being politically correct, 
but to address and change the underlying bias. Because if we get to the core of these issues and change them, there will no longer be a need for political correctness. People will be having fewer offensive thoughts because they will have confronted and hopefully overcome their own biases. As you can probably tell, I care deeply about these issues. Hopefully, I've convinced at least some of you that we should all care. So today, here and now, I'm asking for your help. I'm asking you for, for you to overcome your fear and have courage and do just one of the things I've suggested and then do it again and then do it again. In that way, maybe we can someday create the world that I envisioned as a teenager back in the 1980s. A world where both women and men have equal opportunity to be and do anything they want, whether that be CEO of a major corporation, president of the United States, or a full-time parent. Thank you.